friend asked me, Stephen, how do you make those clay whistles? So I sent her some instructions, but there's some tricky bits in there that I'd like to kind of go over in a video so that you can see it because it's really hard to describe it in words. Uh, it's not too complicated to actually do. All right, so the basis of these clay flutes, this is the mouthpiece. You got a mouthpiece, an empty ball of clay, and a ramp. Those are the three things. So it's empty on the inside. You blow into here, it produces a tone. That's the first piece of the functionality. You need it to be able to work. It can do that wet as well as dry after it's been fired. Then if you add holes, let me see if these holes even function. Okay, barely. Let me get one with better holes. They are very, very fun to play, and I really enjoy making them. This is a small fish. I gave him a hole because I was wanting to wear him as a pendant. He's pretty big for a pendant, but I'm an art teacher, so I can have something that big hanging on my neck and look a fool, and that's fine. This is a new concept I've been working on. This is, it's not a human heart. It is not a human heart. It's got frogs on it, see the little frogs. But from a distance, it kind of looks like a human heart, which is gross. Uh, I'm gonna stop saying human heart now. But what this is, is this is a double. So you see I've got two places for air to go in, two ramps, so it plays two at the same time and they're stuck together so you can play harmony. Anyway, it's kind of fun to play. I made a very much prettier one. Uh, it's two birds. There's a, a male cardinal and a female cardinal. You do need one size bigger than the other if you want it to play different notes because the pitch is set by the size of the air chamber on the inside. So the smaller it is, the higher the pitch. They also get really loud. So if you make them teeny tiny like this one, this one's made to blow into the tail. They get super loud. So you may not want to do them this size. If you've got 30 students in here making them this size, you're gonna lose your hearing. I made this one for one of my sons. I dropped it before I actually got it to him. And so I super glued this back together to have as a sample for my class. I did make him another one. So there's two ways to go about this at the start. One, you can know that this shape is going to be the mid product. So you got ball clay, you got the mouthpiece, you got the ramp. And so they can decide how they want to tackle that shape. They can do preliminary sketches. Uh, to decide if this is going to be like the nose, like you got a short nose uh, elephant here, so he made his mouthpiece into the nose, worked around that way. Um, this one decided to keep the mouthpiece in the back and work on the other side, so that when you play it, you just see what it is. I like that method, same method here. So the, the actual blowing parts in the back decorated the front. So this little fishy I made, 
I took a different approach. I made the mouthpiece the mouth of the fish, and the buttons are the eyeballs. And I glazed them black or painted them black on the inside. I glazed it black. So you actually play it by kissing the fish, and then the ramp is on the bottom. So that way you actually get to use your whole little sculpture, and it's really disguised the fact that it's a whistle. So they could work all that out in their preliminary drawing with another student piece. So some kind of little alien monster here, and he used this. I don't know what that is, but it's on the top. So you could have them work all that out in the sketch beforehand, or you can just have them make this, and then once they get this, decide what it's going to be. So if I was going to make this a bird, this could be the tail. I could put some wings on here, I could put the head up here. So I'm going to leave that up to you, how you want to attack it, whether you just have them get inspiration as they go and let the clay speak to them and tell them what it wants to be, or if they're going to carefully plan it from the beginning of how they're going to handle working that shape into something. I would recommend making it into something. I've been doing animals the last couple of times with it. That works pretty good. Obviously, this wasn't an animal. I don't want them to just make this shape without anything, because then they're really boring. They, they put a face on it. This one didn't end up glazing anything but it shows the shape nicely. So all that said, let's get into how you actually make them. Okay, you don't need a lot of tools for this. You can do it with very, very few tools. Actually, one of the main tools I use is a popsicle stick. I usually use two popsicle sticks. And sometimes I cut them, like this one. I just cut it with a pair of scissors. And then I took a piece of sandpaper and sanded it to where, I don't know if you can see, it's kind of blurry, but it's, it's kind of got a blade, a sanded blade on that. And I actually use this as a tool because when I'm working with this popsicle stick, this one's the same size. I'll show you that later. Now when I'm doing a smaller one like this one, it's too small for that big popsicle stick. So I actually make me a second set that's smaller. See, this one is cut basically in half this way with an exacto blade to get it down to a size that I can work with those little whistles. I wouldn't recommend doing them this size yet until you've done them bigger because uh, everything just gets so small it's harder to work with until you get a feel for how this works. So what we need is some clay. So you're going to cut your students some clay or let them cut the clay. So they're going to get something that looks sort of like this, and you cut it off the block. So they're going to need to make that. First thing they're going to need to do is take that chunk of clay and make it into a ball. Generally, when I'm giving it to them, it ends up maybe the size of a tennis ball. Depends on uh, how much clay you want to give them, how big you want this thing to be. This is generally about the size I do for my ceramics class. This is one of my favorite assignments, but the first year I tried to do it, so three years ago now, I had some instructions that I'd gotten online at Teachers Pay Teachers, and I had a hard time figuring out how to do the ramp and the mouthpiece so that it actually made noise. It took me quite a while. Each one was taking me about 10 minutes. Sometimes I would only get a few students helped with that part in a class, so it took a long time. They didn't work very well, but over the next two years I've gotten much better at it. And to make one that just is a whistle without any holes isn't too, too hard, but if you want to start putting the holes in there, the more holes you put in it, the better constructed it needs to be because you can start adding holes and then it will stop working if your ramp and stuff isn't right. Even if you got that first note to work, when you start adding holes to make it a flute instead of a whistle. 
Okay, so this is basically what we're looking for. Nice ball of clay. And then I don't have a bunch of these in my class, the clay cutters. So generally I'm walking around and as they get to this point, I either hand them the clay cutter and let them cut it or ask if they want me to cut it. Some of them are nervous about trying to cut it in half because we do need the halves to be pretty equal. So then you're left with two halves. That one turned out pretty good, about the same size. And then you're gonna do pinch pots, two pinch pots. So you're gonna poke your thumb in it, you're gonna pinch and turn. You don't wanna get this super thin. If your walls are too thin, it's gonna be hard to do the sculpting it's even going to be hard to put the two halves back together. So you don't want your fingers to be like this far apart. You know, you want to keep kind of the width of maybe your, your pinky in there on the top edge also. You don't want this top edge to get super thin because that's where you're going to connect these two pieces back together. So you want an even thickness all the way around. And you also want this top part to be kind of flat. So as I'm pinching, the inside is getting a little higher than the outside. So you can you kind of tap it on a hard surface to flatten it out a little bit. I do want to get good contact between these two sides. So that looks pretty good. So I need two of those. So I'm gonna try and make the second one match All right, it's okay if they're not exactly the same size. They just need to be sort of close. This clay is still pretty wet. I just got it out of the bag. So when I'm joining these two, a lot of times when you're joining clay, you want to score and slip. Um, for me, I've found that adding slip to this makes it kind of slimy. And when I'm trying to rejoin the clay back together, I don't think it's helping. So I just score. If you have a faster way of scoring, that's fine. This is one way that the students can do with simple tools. I've got a scoring tool with little teeth on it, like our little rake. Um, and I can just kind of do it real fast. So I'm going to push them together and kind of press and twist and try and get this, these two surfaces to join, especially since I'm not going to use any slip. If you don't find this is working for you or you just really are comfortable with scoring and slipping and you love it and it feels like the right thing to do, I'm not going to be mad at you. Put some slip on there. It just, for this next part, I didn't like having the slip. All right, so I'm pressing it together. I gave it that twist. But there's a big seam in here. So the next step is I'm just going to work back and forth across that seam. And this is why if one of them is a little bigger, it doesn't matter because you can just pull from the bigger side. Kind of go one way and the other. I'm going to work the clay across that seam and that may kind of deform the shape here a little bit, but you can kind of work your hands squeezing it back into shape. And my goal here is to get the clay to where that seam kind of disappears and I kind of lose it as to where it was. Okay, so there we've got a ball of clay again, except this time it's hollow. So I can set that aside. The next part I need is the mouthpiece. So when you give the students their clay, either they're gonna set aside a little bit of it or you're gonna have to give them more clay when they get to this part. You don't need this much. Um, but what I want now is I need to make this part, this mouthpiece part. 
So what I want it to be is a little bit bigger than my popsicle stick. I want a rectangle that I can put that popsicle stick through. And I can even do this part with a popsicle stick. So what I want, I want it to be a little bit bigger than the popsicle stick, not too much bigger. I'm going to make a rectangle of clay. It's basically square. Once I got that, I'm going to take my popsicle stick. I'm going to try and go right through the middle. I want to have some clay on each side and on the top and bottom. So you don't want it to be too tight. I'm going to try and push it straight through all the way out the other side. And I want it to come out the other side in the middle. I don't want it to come out too high or too low. Boom, look at that. That's just about perfect. So this is my little mouthpiece. I find it helpful to cut basically a 45 degree angle out of that mouthpiece. So if I wanted the mouthpiece to be longer, I'd have to compensate for the fact that I'm cutting off this angle here. And you'll see in a minute how that is going to help it fit onto the ball of clay. So I've got my angle cut and I want to line it up. so that it's uh, pretty level with the top of this. You don't want to stick it in the middle of the ball like this. That's not going to work. Right. Up here, like this. Now, a lot of times the students will have it not quite this high. If it's anywhere close, what you can do is take it and set it down. And just kind of drop it gently a few times to level out this surface between the top and the mouthpiece. So this is an important part. And what I do from here is I'm going to trace around that shape. With my little blade. I'm going to pull this guy back out, and that shows me where the mouthpiece is going to fit onto this ball of clay. So then I can score both surfaces. I did, I did go and get some slip for this part. I'm going to put a little slip into these cracks because I'm not going to be able to put as much force as when I join the two pinch pots together. So I'm going to go ahead and slip that a little bit. Okay. So now, what I want to do is I want to join the mouthpiece to the ball of clay. I usually just blend that top, but for the bottom edge and the sides, if I just tried to blend it with this, it just ends up digging into it and I don't get the shape I really want. So what I do is I make a rod of clay real thin and I weld these two together. I don't know the right welding terms to use. I'm laying a bead, I think you might say, using that little bit of clay to keep the shape that I really want. Say, if I just tried to blend it without adding that little bit of clay, then it just digs in and I don't get that nice shape that I want. So I'm just going to press that clay that I made into the crack and I'm going to smooth it on both directions. I'm not looking for perfection here. Um, what I'm trying to get first is just functionality. So I need a little bit more clay. To do that last seam. All right, we're getting real close to it looking like the base shape. 
I'm going to go ahead and push that popsicle stick in. I want the popsicle stick to come about this far in because I'm going to start cutting this mouthpiece in here and I want, the, I want this popsicle stick under it. So if you were using your x-ray vision, you try and imagine how far that popsicle stick is going up into that ball of clay. I don't want it sticking out the other side, but I do want it coming over here. Now I'm going to use my second popsicle stick, my fancy one that I cut off and sharpened. I know it matches up with the popsicle stick. So I want to make a couple of cuts about right here. I'm trying to make this cut uh, pretty much up and down even with the inside of this air chamber. I don't want it way out here. I don't want it way in here. I'm trying to get it right inside of where I think the air chamber is going to be. And then I'm going to cut. See, that's also giving me the width of that popsicle stick. And then I'm going to cut the left and right sides with my handy dandy popsicle stick tool. And then I'm going to try and come in here at an angle. Again, it's going to be about a 45 degree angle. I'm going to try and use this little stick to cut this mouthpiece out of here. This is the part where I really felt the instructions I had that I bought were a little shaky. And <laughs> I understood it a lot better when I went in and tried to write instructions for this that it's really hard to describe. So that is my basic ramp. I went down in the front, down the sides, and then a ramp in the back. And you see that that popsicle stick is there. It's underneath, it's supporting what I'm doing so that I'm not working in free space because it's hard to make this ramp if you don't have something underneath it. And that's what this popsicle stick is doing for me. I'm going to try and carefully pull this popsicle stick out without damaging the ramp. There's one more step I need to do before it'll actually function, and that is there's still clay underneath where my popsicle stick was. So I've got to dig that out. So between building the ramp correctly and then trying not to destroy the work I just did, that ramp is nice, but I need to come in here and get this little bit of clay cleared out. That's why I really like this tool. It's got a nice little curved thing and I can scoop around on the inside. You don't want a bunch of trash down inside the whistle. If you get a bunch of stuff down in there, it's not going to function. I'm looking down in the hole trying to make sure that there's no little trash that went down in there. I'm trying to cut up and under that ramp a little bit. I want it as clear as possible inside there. I wouldn't suggest trying to go super small until you get used to doing them kind of at this larger size. It's because all of that issue gets harder to deal with when it gets smaller. So I'm going to stick my regular popsicle stick back in there. Oh. So when I pushed it back in, it pushed a little trash out of the hole. So I'm going to try and get that out of there. So all these little bits of clay, if they go inside and stick in there, they can keep it from working. And you will be frustrated and not understanding why the thing's not working. Sometimes it's just because there's a little trash down in there. You want a nice clean air chamber. So I'm gonna, I put it back in. I'm just gonna try and clean up this ramp shape now. Back to nice like I had it. It doesn't have to be exactly a 45 degree angle. Want this nice and clean. Like the, like the way it was before I had to go in there and dig out that clay. 
I'm going to take my time here. I can always speed up the video if I need to, but... That looks decently clean. I'm going to gently pull that popsicle stick out. I say gently because the, the front edge of this uh, ramp is very delicate. It's very thin. So whenever I work on it or clean it up, I'm working very carefully. All right, I think I've got something that should function now. So now you can see all the way down into the clay ball. You still see I've got the nice ramp. It's angled. It's sharp. Um, and then the clearance, if I were to put this back in there, the popsicle stick fits underneath the ramp, but it's very tight to the ramp. One of the mistakes I made early on is I thought that, say, the air chamber was like this, that my ramp needed to be in the middle, and that turned out to not be the case. The air chamber needs to be below the ramp. So that's why I've got my popsicle stick, and then the ramp is above it, instead of trying to be centered. And that works much, much, much better. So, saying all that, got myself on the spot here. It should work even wet like this. This is why I made the first few of them an owl. Because to me it sounded like an owl. So that is it. That's it, functional. So from here, the students just need to be careful not to change the angle of the mouthpiece or to damage the ramp. And usually they're pretty good about that. Um, for storage, you can store it this way with the mouthpiece and the ramp down. It's pretty safe. Um, if they're working with it though and they want that to be up, um, what I generally do so that it doesn't float and wander around is whichever orientation I want it to sit at. Say I want it to sit at an angle like this, you just drop it a couple times till you get it the angle you want. It puts a little flat spot on the bottom, makes it where it orients. Uh, but that depends on what you want to do with it. So if you wanted to make this the bill of a duck, and make this like Donald Duck and put his eyes up here. Now, once you've got this functional, I can add clay. I can score and slip and add clay and make this bigger. It doesn't have to stay this exact shape. I could make the mouthpiece shorter. If I really wanted it longer though, I would have built this longer when I cut that rectangle. So I probably wouldn't go any longer, but I could go shorter. Like the little fish is pretty low profile. That could, it can go even shorter than that. Uh, so that's all up to your students, whether they want to decorate it on this side, whether they want to work this into what it is, you want to do it upside down, however you want to do it. This one almost looks like Squidward or something, like an octopus. You could make this like a little mouth with octopus and eyes. Big part is just trying not to alter this area right in here, the angle, the ramp, and uh, the only other thing is, if you want it to be able to play notes, then you need a hole going down into the chamber. Those holes can be in different spots. It depends on how you want to hold it when you play it. So I usually either play it this way or inverted, depending on the sculpture. So I might play it upside down like this, or I might play it vertical like this, and that's going to determine where your holes are because the way you hold it is going to show you where to put the holes. So I hold it the way I would want to hold it, figure out where I want my fingers to rest. And I usually don't do that until after I've sculpted it a little more. So if I was doing a bird, I might want to strategically place those holes. So I wouldn't do it at this stage. I would go ahead and start sculpting and put the holes in later. But just to show you what I've been doing to cut the holes, I like this tool a lot for cutting the holes. Um, a lot of times I'll, once I've done my sculpture and figured out where I want my fingers to be, I'll just go ahead and make like a little X and check that and make sure that's where I want the hole. And then I start the hole about like that. And then from there, I really like this tool because I can pull out. Remember when I said you don't want trash inside? 
So if you've got a great way that you love punching holes and it's not going to push trash inside there, do that instead of this. I did have more of these tools. I'm down to this one. They tend to get broken pretty fast and I haven't replaced any of them. But what I'm trying to do is with this one, I'm twisting it and then I'm pulling out that material. So hopefully it's not winding up inside the ball of clay too much. I also like this one because it's it's a nice round shape. I can work with uh, something like this to really get that nice round shape. Sometimes I do, depending on what the sculpture is, sometimes I don't want them to stand out, so something like this would work very nice. Sometimes I want them to be raised, like these eyeballs. So I, would, I could keep this in here and build me a little piece of clay around it you know, and work it around there and then press it in. That's another reason I like this tool, but I'm gonna go low profile here and see if I got a note. That's very, very nice. And so far I've only been tuning them by ear. I try and go up like a step so that it changes it from one note. Um, and then if you only cover part of it, you can get like a half step or you can kind of rock your finger back a little bit to change the pitch. And that's it. The rest of it is all just sculpting. Um, you can score and slip to add material. If I wanted to add a beak, I'd basically make the shape that I wanted, score and slip it on there. So I'm not gonna go over how you do all that. The main part was how you get it functional. So this one's functional. Uh, and then if the student you know, needed help, they had gotten it messed up, then I'm going to try and get that popsicle stick back in there, check the ramp, look for trash down inside. And those are the big things to check. Check the ramp, check the angle here, and try and maybe shine a light down in there and see if they've gotten some junk down in it. Keep it pretty clean in there. And you should be in good shape. You can put more holes. The most holes I usually put is six. And that changes it. You know, you've got six plus one. So that's seven notes. Um, or you can go more or less. A lot of times the students are happy with just like two different holes. Just depends on uh, what they want to do. And that's it.